It's great Congrats. to have you up and running around on President's Day, John. A- absolutely. Hey, and I, I actually can give your listeners a guarantee for today, which is their, I guarantee their portfolios will not go down in value today. How's that? <laughs> because it's President's Day and yeah. the markets are closed. Uh, that's exactly right. But the guarantee comes off at 4 o'clock today. So. Well, let me ask you this question. So uh, international markets, of course, are still operating and functioning. So, right. but uh, the portfolio updates won't be done until the close of business or the open of business tomorrow. If you have international stocks, correct? Correct. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. You would. You certainly there would be uh, some fluctuation that would occur uh, on a, a global basis. But however, uh, you're absolutely right. You won't see that pricing locally until uh, things start to trade again uh, tomorrow. So I've asked Phil this question before, but it's been a couple of years, maybe longer. So I want to ask you this question as well, because I read an article on this in Kiplinger Magazine this weekend. The, okay. The difference between an ETF and a mutual fund and why you would own one versus the other, for instance. Yeah, so, so, uh, so let's back all the way up and give a definition of both. Both are, in effect, managed accounts, Okay. So whether you're using an exchange-traded fund or mutual fund, uh, you basically are uh, taking advantage of uh, a portfolio manager, a system upon which those funds are going to be managed. And all of those funds or exchange-traded funds or mutual funds will have some kind of a defined objective to them. Now, sometimes it might be even a, a diverse portfolio, but typically it's going to be a particular asset class that they will uh, specialize into. A mutual fund is comprised of all of the securities that are inside of there, but the fund itself has a share value. That share value during the course of a trading day will not change until you get to the end of the day and the, uh, uh, the fund has a chance to assess the change of all the positions that it holds, at which point in time, sometime, you know, after hours, uh, your mutual fund will then get a new share value that will be uh, assigned. And that's why if people are checking, like, their online accounts and stuff and they hold a mutual fund, you know, sometimes why then overnight from the last time they had checked it at, say, you know, 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon the day before, by the time the next morning rolls around, the value may have changed up or down because their mutual fund has been valued based on the uh, underlying value of those securities that were in that fund. Whereas an exchange-traded fund literally – it trades just like a stock does. So the value of that, uh, that fund, you know, of the exchange traded fund, is determined on an ongoing basis throughout the course of the day. Uh, if you execute a transaction to, say, for example, sell or to buy a, an ETF, um, say, at 2 o'clock on, on a given day, you actually make that purchase at 2 o'clock, whereas that mutual fund purchase or redemption is not actually going to execute and transact until you get to the close of business on the same day. Now, one of the things that uh, mutual funds do, John, and it, it's, it's I remember being a young investor and being frustrated by this, was in a year when the market was down and my <laughs> mutual funds lost money, I would get a capital gains tax hit from that mutual fund sometimes. And I'd call my guy and I'd say, why do I have to pay taxes on a mutual fund that lost money this year? And they would try to explain it to me, but my, my hot-headed Sicilian temperament only heard tax bill due, tax bill due, and not the explanation. <laughs> yeah, those 1099 surprises uh, after volatile years are no fun at all. Is that what you're saying? Correct, sir. Yeah, exactly. So here's what happens. So and this is interesting, and I have to remind people of this from time to time. And, and, and 2022 uh, was and is and will be a good example of this. So, you know, we're just uh, right at the, the front edge of, of tax filing season right now, and people are just beginning to digest those 1099s and uh, look at them. Now, on, and th so real quick, none of that affects if it's inside of a qualified account, so whether it's an IRA uh, or a, a Roth uh, IRA or inside of like a, a 401k account and so forth, those those uh, internal entry year uh, changes have no effect or impact whatsoever. This is only really on non-qualified accounts, regular money accounts. And so what happens is a mutual fund, when you buy into a fund, so let's say, for example, somebody purchased a fund uh, at the beginning of this month. 
Well, they have to remember that there are underlying investments in that fund that are legacy holdings. Those funds have been there, or not, excuse me, not those funds, those individual securities have been there for some time, okay? So let's say, for example, the portfolio manager bought XYZ Industry five years ago, and it has a really low cost basis, but there's a lot of gain on XYZ Industries. And then what happens is during a year where you have a lot of, of market volatility, it's inevitable. Somebody then is going to um, get an itchy trigger finger uh, and sell out of that uh, fund. The more people that sell, what that creates for the portfolio manager is a liquidity challenge. They then start liquidating positions that have been in those funds. Sometimes those legacy positions that have a lot of, of unrealized capital gain that is embedded in those holdings, say from five years ago, as those positions get sold, now what all of a sudden has happened is that at the mutual fund level, there's now been a capital gain has been generated. By the time you get to the end of the year, uh, so you get to New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve, December 31st, the value of your holdings may have actually gone down in value. And the reason why your 1099 then at the beginning of the year shows that you made money is because the portfolio manager, because of the volatility that was being experienced and the, the redemptions and the liquidity needs against the fund, they were selling things that actually had unrealized gains uh, embedded in those holdings. And unfortunately, those, uh, those gains pass through to the shareholder of record at the, uh, the close of business on, uh, at the end of the year or whenever the year-end capital gains are declared. So oftentimes it's not necessarily December 31st, but sometime in you know, middle of December to the end of the month. And so that's, and it's interesting though, Rob. So the, the inverse of that is true as well. And over the years, so yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. And over the years, I've had to remind people of this. And we've actually gone back on a couple of occasions and, and shown, had to show clients uh, some, some specific uh, examples where years where the financial markets, where uh, equities in particular, have, have had a great year. They've gone up in value. And maybe you've had, say, a 15 or 18% return in your portfolio, but then look at your 1099 at the end of that year. And you had very little, perhaps, that flowed through as a taxable capital gain. So what happens is oftentimes those two almost move in an uh, inverse relationship to one another. Markets will go down, and you wind up with recognized capital gains. Markets go up, and uh, basically not necessarily capital losses would flow through, but very little gain, if any, would flow through on those years. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I appreciate the explanation. And ETFs don't deal with those same? Yeah, t t typically not. Typically not. Yeah, typically uh, with an ETF, you know, you've got more of a pure holding in the, uh, uh, in the, the securities themselves. And so the pricing is tied to uh, the day that those positions were uh, uh, put into that security uh, based on uh, your existence in that holding. The best example I've, I've ever used with people with regard to uh, a mutual fund is, and those, those uh, deferred capital gains that flow through at the end of the year after a bad year, imagine you got invited to a party, you walked into the front door, and you come to the realization as soon as you step in the house that this is not the kind of place that you should be because there are you know, illegal drugs laid out all, all over the place and so forth. And before you can turn to get out the front door, the house gets raided. Here's my question. How many people inside the house are going to get arrested? Probably everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of guilt by association. Same thing happens with a mutual fund. You know, you had nothing to do with what was going on before you got there. But the problem is, once you're inside, the problem then becomes yours that you now have to deal with. And I've, I've always used that example, you know, for, for folks who – and it, it, make no mistake – uh, 2022 was one of those years because of the, the high volatility that we did see where uh, it's, it's uh, highly likely. And we start to warn clients that that's, that's going to you know, possibly happen to a point where we actually then oftentimes you can get a year-end assessment from your fund as to how much capital gain it is likely that they're going to declare. Okay, Here's the problem, though, that an investor faces. 
they could sell their shares of the fund before year in, but then you have to account for how much capital gain do the mutual fund shares have on them that you're going to recognize, or uh, do you sit still, hold the fund, and allow that, that capital gain from that this declared at the mutual fund level to flow through and to, uh, to spill into your tax return. The other thing that I always remind people, remember this, and this is really important that people have to remember this because over the years, one of the biggest challenges we, we deal with is, uh, is this issue where 1099s are issued, clients will realize a fair amount of, of capital gain that had to be recognized. On a non-qualified account, when you uh, recognize those gains as taxable income, that actually becomes part of your cost basis for that fund, okay? So that down the road, sometimes decades later, you want to go change that position, oftentimes because it's, it's become disproportional to the balance of the portfolio or you know, for whatever reasons. Now the issue comes into play, what's your, uh, what's your cost basis in the entire fund? Well, all of those, those capital gains and dividend declarations throughout the years, that's added to your cost basis. And you need to be able to prove that. Uh, financial services firms today are now required to keep track of cost basis for new purchases. The problem is, if, if someone put money into a mutual fund the day I got into this business almost 37 years ago, companies didn't track that cost basis data then. And so as a result, over, over the years, a lot of what people have already paid tax on gets lost, and so that when they go to liquidate, they can't prove what their basis was, and they wind up sometimes paying more tax on a, a, a larger gain than probably what the fund actually had uh, produced over the, uh, that duration of time. And this is why I'm against taxes on capital gains, Bill Stubblefield. Ah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Uh, John, you're making a very compelling argument to stay away from mutual funds. Well, I'm, I'm making an argument that says you have to be careful when you're talking about uh, non-qualified accounts. You have to understand what you're, what you're getting into, okay? For, for probably the average person, it's still a better way to have assets managed than for them trying to establish, say, for example, an individual portfolio, a portfolio of individual securities and things of that nature. Make no mistake, though, ETFs have been um, kind of that sort of a, a claim to that middle ground, if you will, where you're not making the individual security purchases yourself, perhaps, but at the same time, you're also not uh, participating into a mutual fund. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. Inside of a traditional IRA, a SEP, a SEMPLE, a, a Roth IRA, a 401k, mutual funds work fine inside of those kind of an environment because, you know, there's no tax on a year-to-year -year basis that's going to flow through. Yeah, with equities, if you have a substantial gain, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can take preventative action to offset that with other equities. Uh, uh, correct. How do you do that with a mutual fund? Well, yeah, exactly, and, that's, and that's, that's part of the challenge. Now, so again, mo all, pretty much all fund companies, I don't know of any fund company that does not where an advisor would be able or the, the client would be able to, to call the fund company, company up, you know, toward the end of the year. And most, most funds don't know what those year-end capital gain numbers are going to look like until you get to about uh, early December. And typically by then, they, they already know what we're about to declare and pass through to the investor, okay? And they always know per share this is what the, the, the capital gain distributions is, is going to be. So, for example, let's say if a, um, a mutual fund had a, uh, uh, a share price of, say, uh, $20 a share, okay, but it was going to declare a, a $2 per share capital gain, well, that's going to be 10% of the value of your holding in that fund that's going to flow through onto your tax return that year as taxable income. So people actually can assess that. For clients that we work with who do have large uh, non-qualified uh, accounts, that's something that you have to – the advisor should be looking at that before you get to the end of the year because the one thing we don't like is for clients in you know, March and April to call us up and say, holy cow, you know, I owe – 
uh, a large have a, a large tax liability because of of you know my portfolio generated taxable income. If that's going to happen, we want the client to know and understand that on the front end instead of on the back end. Hey, John, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. Uh, yeah, good morning. As a practical matter, going down to the very specific daily activities in, in your office, if you have a new client who's just inherited a pot of money and they, they want to, let's say they're 30 years old, do you prefer the client who hands you the pot of money, whatever that is, and and gives you advice, I would like you to put 10% of it in this and 20% of it in that. Is that your preferred client or is your preferred client the one that says, okay, John, here, do the best for me based on my goals? Yeah, great, great question. So if you think about it, um, if I were a chauffeur, uh, I'm going to try to find the most efficient route to get you from where I pick you up to where you need to go, okay? Okay. I'd almost prefer you not dictate that route that we're going to take, okay? Um, because obviously, you know, someone who, who does that professionally should know, hey, based on this time of the day, that's a bad uh, intersection to go through or whatever. There's going to be a more efficient route if we go this way. Because one of the things that we often see is uh, with, with – uh, one of the hardest things, and I've, 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 I've told people this for the entire 37 years that I've been in this business, is that – one of the hardest things for, uh, for folks to, uh, to control and to keep in check is emotion. And emotion goes both ways, okay? So people get very emotional about money when things are actually uh, running great and we're making money uh, because, you know, the two greatest uh, uh, motivators to mankind are fear and greed, okay? Fear comes in on the downside when markets are moving down greed, and you have to be careful when you tell someone that, okay, because ultimately that's what it is. You know, they, they, they see things are going up, people are doing well. Well, they want part of that. Well, you have to be very careful. So if someone says to us, for example, here, I've got a, got a, a sum of money. I'd like to, to, to put it in, and this is what I want to do with it. We may actually have a different opinion about where we are in some of that, that business cycle, in terms of how things are going to play itself out. Oftentimes, you know, we're going to have a discussion with the client so that they understand that. And th there have been times where we've told folks we may not be, you know, the best answer for them based on our style of, uh, of investment management and financial planning and how we work versus what they're looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And once once you have done these investments again, our, our fictional thirty year old, and he's got uh, you know family, little kids, all that. So you're going to I'm going to guess you're going to invest for the long term, right? Because we're going to be if it's if it's classical strategy, it's going to be more aggressive than it will be if they're investing when, in their sixties. Yeah, correct. Then how do you, how do you tell them to stay away from the financial pages? How often do you want them to be checking, or how seldom do you want them to be checking their balances? Not at all. <laughs> that, 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 that's a great question. So, so i got to tell you, this is, a, this is a true story, what I'm about to tell you. About three weeks ago, I had a, uh, had a lady in the office, and uh, I always start my review meetings with existing clientele. She's been with me for a number of years, and I always start with the same question, which is, is there anything specific on your agenda today that you want to make sure we talk about? And uh, she said, her comment was, John, when are we going to stop losing money? And I, my response was, you're going to be surprised at what I'm about to show you. And most people don't even right now don't even realize this. From October 1st to where we are right now, most portfolios are up pretty significantly in that four-and-a-half-month window of time. People are making money again. And so we got done reviewing what her numbers looked like, and her comment was, she said, John, I had no idea – that things were that much improved. And then she said to herself, why didn't I realize that? And she answered it when she said, looked at me and said, but you once told me when things were bad not to look. And I had to laugh. I said, yes, ma'am, those would have been my words. You know, because again, when you know the news is bad, don't look. And what's interesting was, and then her, she finished up with this comment. She said, but, you know, she said, while I didn't realize that things were, had improved, she said, I think what I, the reason why I was assuming we were still losing money, she said, I'm still buying gas and groceries, and I'm taking those experiences, which are still not fun, and I was projecting it back onto, you know, what my portfolio was probably doing. And it was, I thought it was a very interesting conversation that we had had because, again, you know, she had no idea that things were better uh, because she wasn't 
looking. Uh, and, and for those that, that do look, you really have to have a good understanding and a, uh, the, the, the proper uh, uh, temperament in order to be able to look at that. And Because what most people will do is they'll look at something and say, they'll, they'll uh, internalize, well, today I lost X number of dollars. Well, you haven't lost anything if you haven't sold. Your portfolio has fluctuated in value, but only until you execute that sale transaction, that's when you start to lose money. So yeah, it, it really does uh, kind of vary, and it depends on, uh, it kind of varies from person to person and what their temperament is to be able to, uh, to take those, uh, those fluctuations that they would see and experience. John, picking up on a question John Gilstrap asked you a couple of minutes ago, uh, this euphemistic 30-year-old uh, with a pot of money, what yeah. percent would you break down between equities, investment, mutual funds, ETF as yeah, a general think, rule? Yeah, great, great question. And ultimately, it's going to be driven by, you know, so sometimes, you know, you'll have folks who will still have, they may have a lot of money, but they still may have a fairly short-term goal. So, for example, uh, we're going to put, uh, you know, some, some of this money that we've come into or that we have uh, in, into a house. Well, wait a minute. You know, we don't want to take those dollars and tie them up necessarily into equities. Uh, so, again, once we really understand what the client is, uh, is, is looking for, then we're going to you try to make that allocation into uh, various time spans of money, if you will. So what we would need on a short-term basis, maybe an intermediate term. So, for example, even if you had a 30-year-old who maybe has a, uh, a 10-year-old child, well, if they want to send them to college, well, that's, that's only eight years away. You know, it's kind of right at the edge of an intermediate term to a long-term goal. So, you know, you can afford a little more uh, volatility perhaps there. But for a 30-year-old who says, look, I'm going to probably work until I'm 60, 65, maybe 70, years old anyway, because I'm going to live to be 110, okay, you know, uh, we're, we're going to be fairly aggressive, you know, over that duration of time. So it really kind of depends from person to person in terms of, uh, you know, how that breaks down. What is interesting, and I remind people this all the time, even folks who are 75, 80, 85 years old, um, because I've had people before have said, well, we don't want anything, you know, uh, aggressive or, you know, that's going to fluctuate in value. And I usually will ask them, do you still buy green bananas? Asking the question, do you buy them green in anticipation of the fact that when they ripen, you will eat them? In other words, you have a perspective longer than just the next couple of days or the end of this week and so forth. And once they answer yes, they, they still buy green bananas. You know, even for an 80-year-old, you know, I've, I've never got the chance to meet Frank Buckles from Jefferson County. But the gentleman lived to be 110 years old. Well, if you're 80 years old now, that's 30 years from now. You can still afford some, uh, some equity exposure inside of a portfolio. So we always try to put it into perspective in terms of uh, where the client is in life. Now, John, Bill is a very confident man. <laughs> he doesn't buy green bananas. He buys banana seeds. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I like that. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> absolutely. He's got a great outlook there. Now, you know, they call Warren Buffett the Oracle of Omaha. Bill here is the Oracle of the Opekin. There you go. <laughs> and he got he bought Tesla stock when it was still Nikola Tesla's company. <laughs> he, he wants to know how to hide those capital gains from the tax man, John. There you go. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I hate to tell him this, but the best way to get away, if it's non-qualified holding, best way to uh, totally avoid the, uh, uh, the, the capital gains is – don't sell the stock during your lifetime. Wait until you get that stuff up in basis. But the problem is you have to die in order for that to happen. So we don't necessarily recommend that either. Bill, this is where I come in. Now, you can avoid <laughs> capital gains by no dating to a charity. And I happen to run a charity myself. Which I, no, there you go. And you can do that as well. And, and, exactly. a, and a very worthwhile charity. Very worthwhile. <laughs> very go. worthwhile charity. It's the retired morning men home. And I'm trying to get it qualified right now. Uh, John, how do people get in touch with you for more advice? So the kind of things we discussed today or whatever their financial needs are. Exactly. Our office is located at 1270 Winchester Avenue here in Martinsburg, uh, or you can reach our office by phone at 304-263-4343. John, thank you so much. Hey, do you miss coaching volleyball at all? Um, sometimes I do. I miss the kids, okay? Uh, I had, a, had a, uh, uh, someone one time, a wise high school coach, who made the comment to me, they said, once I get out of uh, coaching high school, if I'd ever get back into coaching again, I would go to an orphanage to coach. 
and I thought that was an interesting perspective. Ah, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking yeah, they, about. They, they, there you go. So, so some yep. parts of it I missed. Some parts uh, uh, I, I'd rather be a financial planner. Of that. <laughs> John, thanks so much. I appreciate you coming in All today, right, man. All right, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, you too, John. Take care.